G'day YouTube, Warbles on a lot here. As you may have heard, here in Oz, particularly Eastern Oz, following the drought, we've got a bit of a mouse plague. Out here in the forest, it's not so bad. I was only catching at a peak about three mice every two days in the aluminium spring-loaded box trap permanently locked and loaded and ready with a chunk of bread down the bottom of it and being a bit of a belt and braces type not only but also i keep ready and waiting a feed of rat sack i also keep rat sack on the outside of the walls tucked in basically the theory is that any approaching bandit of a mouse or a rat or an antichinus if they get close enough to get right up to the foot of the walls they're going to get themselves a feed of rat sack as a first offering ideally they will go home with a belly ache and they'll decide not to come back scavenging for food in the human's little tiny bit of space i mean there's a hundred acres out there they can live everywhere else they're just not welcome here all right maybe I'm harsh, but that's my theory. If they get past the rat sack on the outside at the bottom of the walls, under the veranda where birds can't get at it, where possums can't get at it, if they get past that, then they come in and they get a feed of rat sack just outside the trap. If they get into the trap, yeah, they get a feed of bread and then they get introduced to half a bucket of water and they can't jump and they can't swim forever. So, People say that drowning is a humane, pleasant, gentle way to die. I don't know. I've never drowned. But these days, hardware shops are full of rat traps and mice traps. And maybe 15 or 20% of those traps involve buckets of water with trapdoors and rollers and ramps and bait stations. And the theory is you're supposed to lure your rodents up the ramp and onto the roller or the trapdoor and drop them in a bucket of water. So I'm not the only person who's catching live rodents and drowning them. It's just that I get to intercede between the box trap and the bucket of water. But the rat sack. Now that means that eventually you're going to get rats that come to the outside edge of the hut. They get a feed of rat sack. They optimistically try to dig into the sawdust under the floor by going through the stone, dry stone wall. And... Uh, they then die, and the price of silencing the mice is that for about a week or 10 days, unless you really, really, really want to dig in behind all that, remove everything that's stacked up against the walls on the inside, and locate your putrefying mice, which is a really, really big job, the price of silence the mice, because otherwise middle of the night they're running around getting into stuff and making noise that's the big problem with it you can you, you can come up with workarounds like you store your breadboard vertically so that they can't shit on your breadboard but they still wake you up in the middle of the night you have to get silence you get the silence eventually with the poison and then you have to smell them going off so we have a procedure for that the procedure is to keep a selection of incense and then come on do your thing there we go we light the incense and that's not a bad idea we have a bit of light. On the smoke. But I'm going to get cold. I'm therefore going to have to light the fire. Once I light the fire. That's going to change the direction of the airflow in the room. The 
because it's going to suck air in through there. It's also going to suck air in through down there. There we go. Down there there is a hole which will suck air. Right up five past six. Yes. Pretty soon there won't be much smoke coming out of that at all. As the uh, miniature pot belly, aka the blast furnace, warms up. Mm. Adding fuel to the fire. As you can see. Pretty much all of the sandalwoody smell and smoke is going up and more or less out through the insulation into the ceiling space above the foam slabs. So something has to be done. to change the ventilation dynamics. Introducing the Peltier Effect fan. 17 minutes past the hour. And we shall see what we shall see. 20 past six. Twenty-one past six with me sitting down so there's nothing to disturb the airflow. I do believe twenty-two minutes past six. I do believe the, uh, the electric motors started to move the fan just a little bit. I could reach over there and give it a, a push start, but that would be cheating. we go. Isn't that fascinating? So the fire makes the stove hot. The heat works its way up through the mounting base. The Peltier device gets hot on one side, cold on the other side, generates electricity, the motor spins the propeller. And the propeller takes the sandalwood incense and belts it out into the room. All over the room.
thus sparing me all the very nastiest aromatic effects of having poisoned the household local rodents, which is otherwise the price of silencing the mice. Damn, but it's difficult to visualise this. Anyway, it's an aspect of life in a squalid little hovel up on a ridge in the forest, which I just could not resist attempting to show you. With slightly different lighting effects. That's kind of interesting. This is caused by uh, the manner in which this torch dims itself is by just switching itself off for two thirds of the time or one third of the time rather than being fully on all the time. Certainly makes it easier to visualise the propeller blades. Isn't it amazing what you can come up with when you haven't got a television to distract yourself from thinking? And that's another strobe effect. Versus full illumination. So, I don't know what your cure is for the price of silencing the mice, but that's what I do. Warbles envelope to YouTube. Ciao.